Thank you. No NCM tonight? Okay, then I guess we're good to go. All right, good evening and welcome to the Norwood Conservation Commission meeting tonight, Wednesday, April 19th at 7.30 p.m. If anyone else is recording tonight's meeting, please let us know now. All right, we'll start with opening roll call. I'll get on the list of Conservation Commission members. Just ask you to verbally confirm your attendance, starting with myself. Stephen Washburn is here. Catherine Walsh. Carly Rocklin. Peter Bamber. Here. John Gear. Here. Kelsey Quinlan. Here. And Olivia Hagland. Absent for now. Absent for now. Okay. Uh, first up on the agenda tonight under public hearings, we have a request for amended order of conditions. This is intersection of Prospect and Washington Street, DEP file number 251-0542. Applicant is Mass DOT represented by Taylor Donovan of VHP Group. Um, we have project description as a request to amend uh, the order of conditions associated with this hearing. Um, Ms. Jones, do you want to get us started with this? Sure. Um, so this request for an amendment um, was actually started. Um, Catherine Walsh is joining us, so you're right in time. Um, and uh, so this amendment request was essentially started um, even before the order of conditions was uh, formally issued um, because um, Mass DOT um, had some feedback on the uh, special conditions that we issued um, and asked for some changes that I didn't feel comfortable making unilaterally uh, since the conditions are something the commission votes on. Um, so this was sort of the best way that we saw forward to um, make the changes that they were asking for, which um, are mostly related to conditions that are sort of generic special conditions that don't apply to the project. Um, for instance, um, you know, there's a condition about providing us the operation and maintenance plan, and that was already provided. So they asked for that to um, be removed. There's also a plan change um, that is part of the amendment request as well. So um, we're being asked to approve um, a revised plan um, that um, shows changes to the area where the this being de culverted um, that would be essentially adding more land underwater rather than riffraff. But I think probably the folks from VHB and Mass DOT can explain um, better than I can um, what the request is. Sounds good. I see we have Ms. Walker from Mass DOT on the line. And, and Ms. Donovan. Excellent. Um, would either of you like to show us, uh, give us a brief overview of the modifications to the plan and uh, details surrounding the request uh, to amend the order of conditions? Yeah, Taylor, did you want to speak to that? or? Yeah, I can um, share my screen um, and just pull up the new, it's not a, an entire new plan set, it's just one sheet. Um, and Tracy Lenhart is also on the line. So Tracy, feel free to hop in if you wanted to run through the changes more specifically. Um, Um, all right, can you look at my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the area, the modification is um, the area, as um, Holly mentioned, near Upland Wood Road, or sorry, Route 1A and Prospect Street. Um, and sorry, there's a little bit of feedback coming from the room. <laughs> um, basically, it was um, this area here that's in the blue shading. Um, it was previously 468 square feet of land underwater impacts. Um, the new impact number, uh, actually, Tracy, I believe <laughs> that 
this might just be the reverse. Did you wanna... um, yeah, this crash footage has been getting less, not increased. So <laughs> it might have been a I think that you might be increasing the land underwater um, by essentially adding more stream bed um, where it wasn't previously. Do I have that right? Yeah, I'm sorry. That is correct. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> um, so it is a higher number of impacts to land underwater, but it's a positive change because it's the creation of a wetland resource where um, previously we had a, a culvert. Yes, thank you, sorry. Um, I just noticed that Tracy did leave, so I wonder if she's having trouble uh, joining, she might be joining us back. Um, but as you mentioned, Holly, it, um, the changes are a result of the hydraulics analysis that was conducted um, since the meeting had closed. Um, and so, yeah, there will be an increase of land underwater. So it's written a little bit, it's a little bit confusing just from this one call out here, but we are increasing in land underwater in that area by moving the head wall. Um, and the thing is, we hadn't called this out initially, um, but this is basically areas that were, that are being created, this uh, new bank created. Um, and then there is a new stone, um, outfall, a new apron that uh, is being shown here, which was already counted in the temporary impacts previously, but we noticed that the apron was left out of the plan. Um, so we just wanted to highlight that as well. Um, could somebody walk through the requested changes to the special conditions as well quickly? Yes, uh, Courtney, I can scroll up to the letter, but if, do you want to maybe walk through them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so condition number two, the liability would be applicant shall indemnify and so harness the Commonwealth Town of Norwood and the Conservation Commission. We are requesting to have this um, condition removed. I know Holly previously you had responded in regards to a request that um, another project had had moved forward with this. However, MassDOT just cannot speak to other projects permitted at MassDOT by other people. Therefore, like our legal counsel has stated that we cannot comply with this condition. So that is just my response in regards to removing that condition. Moving forward to condition 10, oil spills, um, we request that this condition be re revised to remove the words after work. So the condition applies to the construction phase work only instead of perpetuity because the project location is a public roadway. Um, we just don't want to limit without our right of way. Um, condition number 11, as previously discussed, the stormwater operation maintenance plan, we discussed that with you. We did provide it, so we would just like to have it removed since we have done so. Um, condition 12, with the rapid approaching area, we request to have this condition removed because there is no wetland replication associated with this project. Moving forward to condition 15 with invasive vegetation. Um, with this project, again, we, we don't have any wetland replication going on here. Um, Holly, I did notice in your previous comment as well in regards to like a contract mechanism. So although this project does not have wetland replication, the contractor will do whatever they can to prevent and or eliminate the introduction of invasive species during during construction. Um, MassDOT does not have a contract mechanism to do the weeding or the care after the contract is complete. However, um, again, we can do our best to make sure that the contractor meets the terms of our, our native seed establishment spec, as well as one of our mass state 
MassDOT landscape architects um, can conduct a follow-up site visit like a year afterwards. And if mowing is required, then we could put in a request to have it done. Um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, provide a response back on that one regarding your comment. Um, moving on to condition number 16 with uh, vegetation, you know, we're requesting that the last sentence of condition 16 be that any replicated wetland must be satisfactorily established within two growing seasons before the project is considered complete. Um, we would just like that removed because again, there is no well and replication for this project. Um, is there any, oh yeah. <laughs> condition 19 regarding the pesticides, we just request to have this condition removed because it, it does place a restriction on our right of way and what work can be done in right of way. Um, the, the use of pesticides or herbicides within the buffer zone may require another filing with the Norwood CONCOM if required. Um, and then condition 20 with the sand and salt. Um, we must out respectfully request that this condition be removed as well because it is the responsibility of MassDOT to maintain reasonably safe conditions on state roads um, during winter weather events. So this kind of prohibits our operational procedures. And that's the last of the requested revisions? Yes. All right. Um, Ms. Jones, that seems like a lot, but when I think about the majority of it, it seems sort of like um, removing non-applicable conditions that were just sort of included via, not to say like boilerplate language, but sort of what we template as our standard order of conditions and yeah, I think uh, it is boilerplate. I think that's okay. Right. Maybe that is the right <laughs> word then. Um, there do seem to be a few other things like the sand and salt, which understandably are going to cause an issue with maintaining reasonably safe roads. Um, I know there's like other alternative products that are incredibly expensive, but I think sand and or salt are pretty commonplace. Um, so I guess my initial sentiment is, wow, there's a lot there, but I think the bulk of it is just removing some of the non-applicable boilerplate language from the conditions and, um, you know, some further considerations surrounding a few of the other points made. Uh, interested to hear what the other commissioners have to say or questions uh, they may have for. I agree with your sentiments. What do you say, Catherine? I'm not totally convinced I agree with all the sentiments. I mean, I think they're trying to absolve themselves with absolutely any liability possible. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, I get, Taylor, what you're saying. And, you know, with regard to the safety of the road, obviously that's not negotiable. Um, but it seems like super broad. And um, But if you guys are all in agreement, I think that's okay. I'm happy to talk about any of the conditions yeah. in particular. I think that some of them are definitely just generally non applicable as it relates to like wetland restoration that's just not occurring at all. Yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, Holly, are you comfortable with all the exclusions that they articulated? Yeah, I am. I think okay. a lot of the, the, like the sand and salt, the language that's used is yeah. that salt and sand should be kept to. A minimum, um, which is extremely vague and in practice yeah. would be very difficult to enforce. Um, so I I do think that um, none of the requested changes, um, with the exception of sort of the two years of, of um, additional sort of inspections and treatment for um, invasives. That would be sort of the only one where I could see the removal having an additional impact on wetland resources um, for that condition. Otherwise, I think everything meets the, the standard for an amendment that um, there's not additional um, impact than what was originally stated um and um i for that one um 
the alternative of um, providing inspections, um, you know, is reasonable enough to me for that alteration. Okay, if you're comfortable, I'm comfortable. It just seems like they've carved out an awful lot. And, you know, in the spirit of full disclosure, this is sort of the first I'm hearing. I'm sorry, I didn't review the material. Did it, did it come out? Did I miss yeah. it somehow? Okay. okay. So I trust you guys. I trust you too. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, I Mr. Bamber? I would suggest uh, make a motion to issue an amended order conditions and approve the amended plan and conditions as shown. I'll circle that. All right. As we've done in the remote and hybrid environment, I'll go down the list of conservation commission members and ask you to verbally state your position on this vote. Starting with myself, Stephen Washburn is in favor. Aye. Catherine Walsh. I'm going to abstain because I really didn't do a thorough review. Understood. Thank you. Carly Rockland. Aye. Peter Bamber. Aye. John Gear. Aye. Kelsey Quinlan. Aye. Olivia Hagland. Aye. Aye. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for being here tonight, BHB and MassDOT team. We appreciate the uh, refined plans and the interface regarding the refinements to the orders of condition. Yes, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up on the agenda tonight, it looks like we have a certificate of compliance request. This is for 59 period in place, DEP file number 251-0344, Norwood number N2004-08. We, we have a request to continue to May 10th. What do you say about this, Ms. Jones? Some issue with the plaques still? So the issue with the plaques, yes. So um, I, I had, the applicant had put plaques up that turned out to be essentially laminated placards. Mm -hmm. And so we had another talk about um, using something that would be durable. Um, so uh, he requested another continuance. Um, so I I would grant this last one um, to, to give one more shot to this applicant so before more. making him reapply. Second. All right. As we've done in the remote and hybrid environment, I'll go down the list of conservation commission members and ask you to verbally state your position on this vote, starting with myself. Stephen Washburn is in favor. Aye. Catherine Walsh. Aye. Carly Rockland. Aye. Peter Bamber. Aye. John Gear, Aye. Kelsey Quinlan. Aye. And Olivia Hagland. Aye. Excellent. Thank you for that. So we have for COC requests, we're going to move on to wetland violations on the agenda. We have Moderna Way. We, we have rep, uh, updates in the form of the report and plans, perhaps. Yeah. So we have a number of representatives from Moderna here with us. Um, so I can. Um, I can present yeah. Cedar Anderson with Bar. Well, I guess I can stand up here. Yeah, that'd be so perfect. Holly, I did send you a PDF on Monday. Uh, yeah. Oh, great. Good. Beautiful. Yeah, so the last we heard about this, uh, my name is Cedar Anderson, environmental scientist with Bar, for the record. Um, and good evening. Thanks for hearing, taking the time to listen tonight. Um, so back at the end of January, um, there was a event where uh, sediment release, there was a construction project off the page. It's located on the other side of the MTC East building. It was a modular trailer project. Um, January 26th was the date. It was an um, uh, inch and a half of rain. Um, Holly and myself and Luce Casey from Moderna were out on a site visit and there was very turbid water had been released into the wetland. Um, and we we walked the perimeter and initially we thought it was coming from this site, but we discovered it was all flowing from this outfall located towards the southern end of the wetland. And it's a pretty extensive stormwater system that collects runoff from parking lots, um, all located around this area of the campus, including where there was the modular trailer project that was ongoing. Um, so since then, our, we did a evaluation of the impacts to address the enforcement order that was issued. Um, and we calculated essentially the impacted area of this boarding vegetated wetland was approximately 2.1 acres. 
So on the day it was discovered, there was very clearly turbid water, um, very cloudy, you couldn't see through it. Um, but the material was very silt, very fine grained silt material. So that takes a long time to <laughs> settle out. It remains suspended for a very long time. Um, the reason it had flooded so much was this is the clog. There's an outlet here, pretty small pipe. It's not very large. And during the storm, debris had washed down here from the intermittent stream and clogged that pipe outlet, which was not allowing any water to drain from the wetland. So it was just, you know, our water was pouring out this outfall, filling up. There's another outfall here and here. So it collects quite a bit of storm water during large rain events. Um, once this was discovered, this in outlet was unclogged and all of that water was allowed to drain. So during our return visits, we found that very little um, of that material had actually settled out. A vast majority of it went downstream, down the intermittent stream and into the drainage system in Upland Road. Um, most places, all you could really, anything discernible was just a very thin film of um, almost like dust. By the time it dried out, it was a very silty, um, thin film. There was, we did identify one area of accumulated sediment right at this outfall, and that's shown in red there. Um, and this was all we went out with um, subfoot accuracy GPS units and located the boundary of these areas to quantify the impact area and to quantify the area where there was a measurable um, sediment. And this was generally, you know, an inch or less was the measurable amounts. And it was likely not attributed to this one event. Um, after this happened, Moderna right away had all this storm system cleaned, vacuumed, um, so the deep sunk catch basins, you know, if they're not maintained regularly, and once they fill up, they, you know, they stop working. And none of that, so that sediment is just released. So this is likely, you know, accumulation over years or of just steady stormwater outflow. So those were our general findings. Also, there was a, there is a potential vernal pool mapped here. So as part of our evaluation, we delineated this vernal pool, the edges of the vernal pool based on the ordinary high water marks, water stained leaves. Um, it's about 0.6 acres in area. And we also did have done to this point, I want to say, you know, four, four visits. Um, and we found, we've identified uh, 20 wood frog egg masses and about 13 salamander, uh, mole salamander egg masses. So it is a, a certifiable vernal pool. It holds, supports obligate species. And the good news is that they seem very healthy. Um, mm -hmm. Even though there was that sediment release, it's not, it doesn't seem to have been any long-term impacts, more of just a ephemeral, you know, an event. Um, and the wetland seems to be doing a really good job of self-restoring, which is great to see. There's lots of um, skunk cabbage and other herbaceous plants, um, sedges, rushes that are coming up. Uh, I think that was a concern that, you know, if there was a, if there was a large sediment release where it settled out, that might inhibit, you know, growth in the early spring. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so those were our general findings. Um, actions taken so far to date, there's been several. Um, so the construction project that modular trailer is now covered uh, under the NIPTES construction general permit. There was a stormwater pollution prevention plan was prepared and submitted. And so there's also been proper erosion controls now um, at that site as well. Um, in addition, I already mentioned the stormwater system uh, was vacuumed out, cleaned out, and it was also added to, so Moderna uses a, a, like a scheduled system to maintain, you know, the campus, the stormwater system. So that's been added. So it's regularly maintained and can now properly function. Uh, this was also added, this outlet, just maintaining that outlet so it doesn't get clogged again, particularly during, you know, in advance of large storm events like what happened at the end of January. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. That Those were the main um, proactive actions that have been done to date.
Um, what is proposed is this vernal pool. Um, Madera is willing to, you know, submit that information to Natural Heritage and, you know, get that a certified vernal pool from potential to certified. Um, in addition, we think we suggested looking into a debris screen at this outlet. Um, and that's just a consideration because it would be have to be looked at further. I talked to our engineers and you know, they said, you know, it needs to be designed properly to prevent clogging. Um, a lot of times, you know, these screens are installed and they don't necessarily work. So that's something that could be looked further into is a debris screen there to make maintenance not so often. Um, and the last thing would be to remove this area of accumulated sediment. It's about a thousand square feet. Um, and doing that with hand tools with not with heavy, you know, not with machinery, just um, by hand to minimize impacts. It's not very much sediment. It could probably done with, be done with shovels. We don't want to, you know, increase impacts by you know, bringing in an excavator in there or anything. It doesn't really warrant that. So in conclusion, that's, um, that's what the summarized summary of the, you know, the event and, um, restoration to date in the study and what is uh, proposed. Did you have uh, <clears throat> an estimated volume of the sediment that was released? Not that it was released because so much of it went, it's, it was, we couldn't calculate it because it went downstream. We mm -hmm. did based just a rough estimate if we yeah, assume based on the area and some depth or whatever yeah, yeah. if we assume <laughs> it should be about 90 cubic feet yeah so, i guess i was just curious the way you pointed out the nature of like the sediment being so suspended i wondered how much of whatever was released ended up further downstream you mentioned cleaning the stormwater system mm -hmm. down gradient um and you mentioned in particular deep sum catch basins getting cleaned out with the the pipes that interconnect the catch basins also flushed or was this just like a step co coming in and acquiring the the catch basins or like what level of yeah so the it was actually the upstream this whole oh, system okay. upstream okay. um oh so you did do the downstream ones as well though in upland road that's right. Two yep. or three. I yep. forget what how yep. many downstream, but those those are cleaned out, which I know because you had to coordinate it with the DPW yep. to yep. open those up. Right. You need a special key to unlock them. Yep. And the pipes were also flushed out as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was the, the pipes and the catch basins. Okay, very cool. I know sometimes they'll just take a claw and scoop the debris from the catch basin some. And sometimes like a back truck or whatever will be used that you know it takes the material from the sump and can be used to like on yep. the same piece of equipment flush the mm -hmm. you know the connecting pipes that's what was done yeah it was a back truck yeah. that's good <laughs> um that's the following question I asked about pipe flushing questions or comments from the commissioners what do you say over there Ms. Rockland so um when I visited the Vernon the Vernon pool with you guys um I noticed that there was algae right so i was thinking nutrient pollution and i was wondering do you think that that was uh part of this event was it an effect of this event or is that sort of like a long-term issue of stormwater from the campus because an end you know beyond that effects on its function as a vernal pool long term uh that's a good question i would say the nutrient pollution and i wouldn't attribute to one single event um that's typically uh, over time and also it would be a function of the stormwater from the campus it's likely i mean that's true anywhere stormwater is usually at a higher nutrient load even when it is um treated um there is you can't treat it ever you can't get it all out um as far as the algae impacting the um the vernal pool that's uh that's tough to say without doing the go line. i know it's not i've heard mixed things um i mean obviously you don't want you know a lot of algae is not good for the vernal pool species um but if there's i mean it's 
if there's some, it's not gonna, you know, prevent them from surviving or thriving. Um, if it gets to a point, though, obviously it's it's detrimental. Um, but it's really hard to pin down to a single, you know, single event for, um, you know, uh, something like this. I would say, even though the deep sunk catch basins aren't treating the nutrients, cleaning them out probably is helping with nutrients because the mm -hmm. stored several Solid decades solid. of whatever was probably releasing nutrients into the wetland. So it so should be a little bit helpful. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the SWIP plan for the site is the cleaning at the upstream stormwater features. Is that cyclical a number of times per year or is it in an as needed basis? No, it is It is scheduled uh, off the top of my head. I don't know, Lou, do you know how? Well, right now, we haven't been cleaned for a long time. Uh, right now, we have it in our the maximal system. It's a computerized scheduling mm -hmm. system. Right now we have it in there. We're going to visually check it after six months. Okay. And right now we just clean it once a year, visually inspect it every six months. Okay. That's a good question. What else, Mr. Member? Well, I, I think it's very exciting about the adrenal pool um, and certifying it. That would be wonderful. I, am, I after hearing what Ms. Rockland had to say. I'm curious how do we monitor the health of that going forward. What do you say, Ms. Jones? As long as there is active orders of conditions on the property, uh, you know, I think I can check on it. But you know, in in the future, um, as a commission, I don't think that we can. Um, you know, unless there's there's some reason to suspect a violation. I don't think that we can do any sort of active monitoring on it. Um, well, would Moderna be willing to monitor it and report to us on, on occasionally? What do we monitor? The vernal pool. Oh, yeah, right. Right. Exactly, yeah. I, I think too, it's important to mention. So we also have overhauled our industrial stormwater pollution prevention plan. So that will have quarterly inspections outside of the CGP that we're certainly willing to share, um, as well as other best management practices to contain any additional industrial stormwater runoff that may be going to wetlands that could potentially be contributing to anything. So we're happy to share the inspection records, um, which I think at this point are quarterly, um, but that may also help in terms of ongoing performance for non-construction related stormwater pollution. Yeah. So are those inspections in your work order system or is that is that done by a consultant? Yeah, so we, we currently have it in that compliance calendar. It's a tool okay. that we use uh, within the EADIS function uh, because we do the inspections currently. I think long term we have a debate whether we go to Maxima or keep it in that in that okay. got it. So right. So they currently have sort of two different permits and plans. One is for the active construction, um, and that will be closed once active construction is closed and then they have an ongoing um nifty's permit and and plan for sort of the the routine housekeeping of, of running an industrial facility i don't know <clears throat> enough about the nhesp program but i imagine they also have some type of like outreach awareness and collaborative effort once a vernal pool like this is identified and registered with them right I think really it just gets mapped unless there's um, a rare endangered or threatened mm -hmm. species. So then they would be monitoring it as far as I think what we have here are yellow spotted salamanders and wood frogs, which there are some mole salamander species that are um, threatened in the state, but um, I don't think that we have those. Um, here. It sounds like through the quarterly inspections and reports that occur, we'd have some insight into mm -hmm. the status of the vernal pool. I think that's what I hear. Yeah. From behind me somewhere. I, <laughs> I'm not. No, not for. I don't think that uh, the switch inspections wouldn't cover the vernal pool now. So right now, there's no 
mechanism of insight for conservation as it relates to the vernal pool then, is that right? Right, we would be protecting it under our regulations if something is proposed within 100 feet of it. Mm -hmm. um, and otherwise, we would be just letting it do its thing. So in like a doomsayish hypothetical scenario where ongoing stormwater prevention activities don't end up impacting the algae bloom that was observed and it continues like a runaway train to just overwhelm that area and does become a detriment to the species that are populating the vernal pool as it stands that's just what's going to play out and there's no there's no response or effect that could be I don't think we can have ongoing conditions in an enforcement order. Like, I think we can maybe for a certain a limited time, but not in in perpetuity with the land once the enforcement action has been addressed. Um, so maybe the question is, is has this enforcement order stepped up your SWIFT plan sort of inspections and compliance? I certainly think from a CGP perspective, absolutely for all construction activity. I would say the site industrial stormwater pollution prevention plan too that we've done. It's brand new. It's um, fully exhausted. We have uh, obviously the PMs that we've done for storm scepters, which haven't been done since uh, a very long time, right? right? So that in terms of any additional nutrient pollution or anything else that would be externally exposed and causing runoff into the wetlands will be covered under that um, industrial swift. And I think we've shared it with Holly, and again, we'll share the entire yeah. plan if there's any interest, but. It's over 100 pages long. It's, it's very, very yeah. comprehensive. Right. That's, our yes. <laughs> That's our hope. That's our hope. With respect right. to what we're doing to make sure that anything not infrastructure related wouldn't further contribute to any of that pollutions. Lou, what was the, the amount of sediment we pulled out in the cleanup? Over 80 tons of sediment. What'd you do with the sediments out of curiosity? You take it away. They took it from the site. Product. Under the NIFTY's permit, do you, are you required to test the outfalls at any interval? Uh, I have to check the uh, plan. There is a testing requirement for stormwater runoff for certain outfalls for okay. industrial activities. So okay. there is some testing component that's in line with the, the NIFTIS requirement. Okay. But again, we can share the plan. It's all in there in terms of testing frequency and what parameters we're looking at. You think it's some like major spike in? Well, if it's doing the similar yeah. the similar tests that are you know occurring in other outfalls, you can get an idea of temperature, phosphorus, yeah, the yeah. usual, and that might be Sediments, yeah. you know that would potentially impact the health of the yeah. vertical yep. So. Yep. that's a good thought. I would say as far as like the biobanking site up here, which contributes to this there's an outfall here, the stormwater treatments significantly improved as the site is updated, they're adding more, you know. Yeah, we just current. recently reviewed, I think, uh, a program and project or site area, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? So I think my um, sort of question is just establishing a timeline for certifying the vernal pool and then um, doing that hand removal of sediment accumulation and what a, a reasonable plan is for that to occur by. So we had suggested for the for the certification that can be we have the information that can be submitted this spring for natural heritage um <clears throat> the sediment removal we propose doing it during the dry season just to minute to keep the impacts minimized you know wait till there's so much activity going on right now um so more towards the end of the summer um, when the water levels are generally lower um when we were out there this was all you know water was you know, close to this area, we just want to minimize any turbidity. So we were thinking, you know, August, September for that removal. And as far as providing, submitting that information, uh, natural heritage that can be done, you know, this spring, early summer. What do you think about that, Mr. Um. I'd like to see a little bit more um, motion on on both of those timelines. Um, right, the submitting to NISHA, you know, takes 
an hour. Um, and the the removal of sediment, um, I I agree that it's better to wait until things dry out a little bit. Um, but I also worry that sort of the longer you wait, the more opportunity for that sediment to be mobilized. mobilized. Yeah. Um, so um, I would think maybe July, for instance, would be perfectly appropriate um, as a drier month. Um, in the sorry report, you had written the end of the growing season, which is even past September. Um, so that was a little bit. Um, yeah, that could be like end of year or whatever, right? Yep. Yeah, November <clears throat> is sort of what I think of as the end of the growing season. Um, so that's, those would just be my suggestions is maybe like by the end of April have, have submitted to each up, right? And when they respond would be up to them, but, um, and then um, maybe completing the, the sediment removal prior to August one. Those seem like reasonable timelines to me. Mr. Gary, what do you think about this? Seems, seems good to me. Um, I think that um, I, I definitely understand you want to get in there when it's dry, <laughs> but um, given that we can't predict the future, um, if a window opens up sooner, that it, we have a dry spell and it's easier to get at it then, I would rather see it basically taken care of as soon as possible, mm -hmm. provided you can get in there with it up, with it not being wet, because mm -hmm. um, it's just going to cause more damage. Yeah. All right. So, what are our recommended next steps, Ms. Jones? Um, so a lot of the, the plan that PAR has proposed has already been completed, um, and I think there have been pretty significant and visible improvements um, to the um, stormwater maintenance uh, for all of the project, projects across Moderna, which has been great to see, even the ones outside of our jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, yeah, I, I would propose approving the um, the plan. Um, so I also wasn't quite sure what to do with that grid suggestion. It sounds like you're sort of throwing it out there, but you don't want it to be approved as part of the remediation plan. Yes, because when I talked to our I talked to our engineers and they were a little hesitant to commit to that just because well they say well we can look at it we can design it but until we like really do that deep dive we can't say oh, we might find out that it's it's not going to work and that just based on the configuration of that outlet mm -hmm. so that's why we don't want to just commit to it um, yet it's something that you know can be looked into and if it is appropriate then add it and it's more of just the main a maintenance uh, a maintenance thing you maintained less rather than you know having to clean it out very regularly clear it out so i think we'd be willing to to commit to investigating whether we could just periodically pm the, the drain just to right. check to make sure that's clear and, and service it if we need to on a massive basis we could start quarterly and, and move on from there mm -hmm. if we think a uh, silk screen is not the right right, right approach so that it doesn't get clogged again yeah that's amenable mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, right, I would recommend approving the proposed um, remediation plan for the violation um, with those two suggested changes of, of being a little bit stricter with the, the timeline for certifying the vernal pool and for um, removing the sediment accumulation. Anyone like to make that motion? 
I'll make that motion as stated by Ms. Jones. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bender. Thank you, Ms. Racklin. As we've done in the remote and hybrid environment, I'll go down the list of Conservation Commission members and ask you to verbally state your position on this vote, starting with myself. Stephen Washburn is in favor. Catherine Walsh. Aye. Carly Rockland. Aye. Peter Bember. Aye. John Gear. Aye. Kelsey Quinlan. Aye. Olivia Hagland. Aye. Excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you for being here again tonight. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah. GIS figures easy, easy to read. I like it. Thank you. 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 Sometimes I point out when PDF comments are used. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So, for commission business, we do have uh, Riley Adams here with us for number three. So, I suggest taking that out of order if you're amenable, Mr. Chair. Let's do it. Conservation Commission yeah. business is next up on our agenda, and we can leap right to line item number three Memorial Bench Donation. It sounds like we have Riley Adams here with us this evening. Best thing on the agenda. <laughs> Love it. Usually I save the best for last. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, hi. So I was wanting to um, raise money for a bench to put in the Cooper Park um, as a memorial for Aaron Greenfield. Yes, um, and I guess Cooper Park is under the jurisdiction of this mm -hmm. commission, right? And um, he has spoken to the widow and of uh, considered sites that are already available. But unfortunately, um, you know, Cooper Park is is not yet ready. So, but that's really yeah, where um, what she would like because um, she said that um, Mr. Greenfield and Mr. Cooper used to talk, and she thought that would be a fitting place for them to continue to have a connection. And I spoke with. Uh, Mr. Cooper's widow as well, who was really excited about that idea and appreciated it as well. So we do have some funds and we don't know, I guess, the total of how much money we should be raising, though we have had even just talking to people about the idea of like, here's, a, here's some money. So we have some funds and I don't know how that gets deposited or, or to who or but I have two checks. <laughs> <laughs> And hopefully they're written out properly. They say time of and I don't know. Perfect. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I guess things. I don't know. We did don't you know guys know Mr. Sister. Greenfield? I did not. Know. Oh, did you? Oh, interesting. Just, I was curious uh, yeah. to hear more about Mr. Sure. Greenfield if there was any uh, other history other than the former yeah. relationship with Granny Cooper, Cooper, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I am. Do the I first started doing this um as um my service project for my bar mitzvah and um Mr. Um Greenfield was a Holocaust survivor so I thought that he was a very um inspiring person to be able to do this job. So who would, can, who would pick the location for a bench? Um, his widow. She she would like it in the in the park, but I don't know. She's now is, is she living in Florida, and she just is temporarily in Florida. She went to um, there. It's not Boston. She persists. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, that nothing's been determined, obviously. Yeah. So the, the, park the is site of the park, out, right? but as far as a specific location within that park, yeah. that hasn't really been considered. That was that was the question. Yeah. yeah. Would you want to be involved with that? Um. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Good. You should be. Yeah. You might want something with a water view. Yeah. 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 I guess picking nice. the, I don't know. I imagine the benches are standard throughout the park. And how maybe it can be done in a way that there can be a plaque or something. Mm -hmm. indicate, so. Yeah, we would definitely get something with a plaque. So I would want to work with you to, you know, find the right language. You know, this this bench is placed in honor of Aaron Greenfield and or whatever it may be um, that we want to put on that plaque. Um, and yeah, I think 
overlooking the river would be a good spot. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. And, and in the event that his widow is able to visit the park, maybe something that's accessible to her. I don't know how accessible the the whole park should be ADA accessible to people in wheelchairs. So what would the next step as far as, um, I guess, periodically, if we get my nose, should get it to you and yeah. so we'd, we'd like to maybe develop a budget in some way. Yeah, I think I had sent Riley a yeah. quote for um, a bench. Okay. Okay. Um, it's in the realm of seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars, mm -hmm. including the shipping. Mm -hmm. um, I forget what it is. If we are sort of ordering bulk benches, it might be that the shipping goes down sure. as part of the perk um, building. Um, but um, that's sort of the most recent bench quote that I have. Mm -hmm. So I can resend that so that you have it sort of fresh at the top of your inbox. I feel like sometimes we've done some outreach with some of the scout projects, which this is very much in line with, like putting it up on the ConCom um, site. It would be awesome if we could help Riley do some fundraising too. This sounds like an amazing project. Um, so I would be in support of that if any of the other commissioners would. I certainly do. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Good for you. We have a final layout for the podcast. We don't have a final layout. No, <laughs> I've seen tentative site plans. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have we have our conceptual, and we have you know it's getting closer. But is there an anticipated date of completion? When I'm looking forward when a patch might actually be both done. Yeah, great question. So um, the Current plan is that we'll be doing, uh, putting the project out to bid um, in the winter. So November, December, um, awarding the bid and then the contractor would get started um, in the early spring. So maybe beginning of March. Um, so we would hopefully be looking for the park to be nearing completion around May of next year. Um, but I, if there's one thing I've learned about construction projects, it's that they always take longer than you think and hope. Um, so it might well be later than that that we're sort of wrapping things up on the park. So late 2024? Yeah, Riley will be in college by the time we get going. Let's hope not. Yeah, let's hope not. It's true. Yeah, so. So spring, early summer 2024 would be when we're sort of finishing the construction. And we'll be starting some of the work with um, removing invasive species and doing some of the the starting tomorrow Saturday. Plant based starting Saturday. Yeah. But we'll be bidding sort of the larger chunks yes. of that um, to get started this fall. So, so we'll stay in touch. Yeah, it's great. I think this is wonderful. I think we might be just looking for a motion to accept the donation from Riley Adams uh, for Memorial Bench honoring Aaron Greenfield with immense gratitude from the Conservation Commission. Yes. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we've done in the remote and hybrid environment, I'll go down the list of Conservation Commission members. Just ask you to verbally state your position on this vote, starting with myself. Stephen Washburn is in favor. Aye. Catherine Walsh. Aye. Thank you, Riley. Carly Rockland. Aye. Peter Bamberg. Aye. John Gear. Aye. Kelsey Quinlan. Aye. Olivia Hagland. Aye. Excellent. Thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Gear, for your recommendation of including Riley in the site selection process. I think as we say communication, we get closer to uh, go time. We'll talk about either visiting the site, uh, maybe even with some of the ConCom that are present for that, uh, or remote viewing of the site plan or something in person on site. Mm -hmm. it's too much to right? yeah, this, this is outstanding. You it also is. want to um, like ask his widow about that. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah, get some input from her and certainly invite her to participate. I think is your sentiment. Yeah. Awesome. Yep, mm -hmm. I like it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Riley. Thank you, Kevin. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much.
Oh, every year it could be so wonderful. All right. <clears throat> Still under Conservation Commission business. Exciting, but maybe not quite as much. We have uh, the Indian Orchard update. What do you say, Ms. Jones? Um, the irrigation went in today, not tomorrow. It came a day early. A day late is wonderful. <laughs> I mean, a day, a day early is wonderful. A day late is not. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Um, um, it's So it's all laid. It's not um, hooked up yet. We'll be coordinating with the water department about the best way to hook it up. Mm -hmm. And I was there this morning and I'll add as well that the um, community garden addition is coming along well. All of the new water spigots at the community garden are done and the DPW um, spent all day today carrying loom um, to chop dress the, the area that's being added to the community gardens, um, which was um, very good of them. And they also redid the um, parking lot up there to mm -hmm. sort of make a little more room. Um, so that was um, great to see and um, greatly appreciated. I was given a task to coordinate a volunteer day at our last meeting that I haven't done yet. Yep. So I apologize for that. And we'll try to remedy that soon. Um, and I do recommend visiting the orchard if anyone is. I was going to say I've been by a couple of times recently and like not just the orchard, but um, just all the activity at the community garden, the irrigation system, the orchard surviving and thriving dare I even say it's really awesome to see it seems like all of our bushes lived mm -hmm. which is exciting even the little tiny um sweet ferns um the so mild winter help yes yeah you're right yeah yeah and the so the service berries and some of the cherries and plums are blossoming right now so exciting so cool. All right. Uh, I could dwell on the orchard for a bit more, but let's move on to the CPC report. What do you say, Catherine? Um, so no update. We still have the original um, group of projects. Um, we met earlier today just to go over the um, town meeting warrant. I hope I'm using the right words, but what it will be presented in the informational meetings in advance of the town meeting and what will be presented. Um, and um, Kristen did a great job with regard to that. So um, we're feeling pretty positive about that. The reserve, um, even if we find all those still look strong and uh, nice segue into Holly getting a little permission to continue to spend some CPC funding. Yes, so. Um, yeah, let's I've, talk about the next item because I freaked out when I said I know, this. I know. It's all good. Um, so, right, so I wanted to talk to you about this uh, sort of additional design um, add-in of uh, making sure that we know uh, any sort of hazardous materials or contaminants that might be in the soil at the Cooper Park. Um, there's some work that has been previously done on the site um, by two different LSPs. Um, and I had the opportunity to talk to um, the most recent LSPs who are employed by um, VCD Realty, um, who we bought the land from, um, and they they were pretty confident that the work they had done on the site um, didn't show anything that would be um, overly concerning or reportable to um, the state. Um, but their main focus was across the street at 84 Moore Street, um, and so the suggestion from our consultants um, was just to make sure that we knew what was in the soil um, for a couple of reasons, um, both to make sure that there's nothing overtly hazardous there, um, particularly for uh, construction, uh, folks involved in construction of the park, um, and also just so that we are prepared um, if we do have to move any soil off of the site, um, any sort of landfill um, would require knowing um, knowing what what is in the soil before accepting it. 
we're hoping not to have to export any soil from the site, but it, it could come up um, related to sort of excavating where the pads are going in. Um, there was 11, so the change order to do this work um, was just over $15,000. And we had $11,700 um, remaining in the CPC allocation that was used to purchase the park. So um, that we have CPC funds for the design and construction. So this is sort of the previous pot that has been um, for the project that has been wrapped up. So the CPC just this evening um, did vote to allow uh, those funds to be put toward um, this effort to, to do the um, hazardous soil um, characterization. So um, I chatted with Kristen earlier today. Um, she had been uh, getting quotes for sort of for signs for the park for while it's in construction, just explaining what the project is. Um, so we talked about using sort of a, maybe a couple hundred for that and then the remainder for um, this hazardous soil characterization. Um, and I think that so I would like to ask um, at this point uh, for the commission to consider um, sort of chipping in the remainder of that, which would be um, like 4,500. Um, from where? From from the Ellis Pond. My question about that and the other plants, uh, do, are we all lined up for the invasive species treatment and does this it's, impact that? So we're lined up. We have our contract signed. Mm -hmm. um, I asked, so I did a change order to that PO where I had um, encumbered the full amount for the contract. Mm -hmm. And I looked at sort of the the dates of the treatments and I raked back um, so that I had only encumbered the amount for fiscal year 23 that we're in. And, and, you'd, so, and you'd encumber after July 1 the remainder? Yeah, so then after July 1, um, we would be paying from fiscal year 24. Mm -hmm. And so that with doing that, um, our remaining funds are uh, 13,000. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also with already paying for the irrigation. Um, and so could I just add one thing? I want to echo what John Hall said, um, sort of at toward the end of the discussion, like everyone was totally supportive. But you know, one of the reasons we supported it is because we felt like this was a design component. Right. And so mm -hmm. it wasn't really like an ad scope. It was informing how the design would happen. So yeah, it was consistent with the original authorization. If there right. was a question, another question I would have is that if we found contaminants, there would be have to be a new source of funding to haul it away because if, if it's required. Because my understanding of these types of projects, because we've looked it into it in the past and other parts of town, is that you remove the sediment, uh, spread it out, stack it, mix it, and then test it to see if it meets certain standards. And so if you have a heavy contaminated no. area. No. <laughs> well, that's what we've been told. It sounds place. like a weird take on composite sampling or something. Oh, well, no. I'm, I'm telling you that we looked into dredging areas, and that's exactly what was stated. Yeah, soil remediation is incredibly costly, and it's a can of worms that once you open. Right, but let me, let me finish, please. Yeah. And so what was explained to me was that if you took it all from an area and there was too high a count, then in this particular case, it was going to be an additional million dollars to haul it away. So that's my point, is that regardless of the sampling, is once you take it out and it's sampled and you test it, the cost goes way up. And so my point is, where will those funds come from if we find adverse sampling? Yeah, so 
if we did find something adverse, um, we would, if it was over a particular official, we would have to report it to Mass DEP right. and the town would become responsible for remediating it. Um, You're right, and it would be a different source. So, so it's not, uh, let's use the right terms, it's regulated material because, you. because you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't necessarily need to be like hazardous, but regulated means you know, you have to yeah. jump through a bunch of hoops. So you're yeah. absolutely right, Peter. Like none of this original project scope anticipated the management of any regulated right. soils. But I do think, you know, what Holly presented earlier at CPC is that um, the consultant um, doesn't have a lot of anxiety, but feels sure. like in terms of worker safety, we should put a check in that box. Mm -hmm. and oh, so I don't disagree. Let's all, let's all yeah. keep our fingers crossed. So, yeah. 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 Set up a grid and do cause. I don't think it's going to be that granular because we're not characterizing. Or they're not, and we're they're not characterizing for disposal. I think right. they're really trying to get a like get just, just an, an overview. Right. Is is that yeah, accurate? Yeah. So some of it would be right, sort of the more desktop work of looking at the history of the yeah. site and creating a report on that, and then um, yeah, I think it would be probably not a grid, but it would right. be. Augering um, yeah. throughout, and, and the thought is is that there's they don't anticipate a lot of soil removal, so mm -hmm. that's why they're not grid testing. Um, so you know, yeah, on the QG, so our, our goal is to do no soil removal. Um, Sunset has to be pretty permanent, so we don't know what that looks like. Yeah, but we are going to be doing that. Yeah, but we are going to be doing that. Yeah, but we are going to be doing that. Yeah, but we are going to be doing that. Yeah, but we are going to export comes from this we could run out of sort of spots on the site to put it mm -hmm. yeah i'm just nervous yeah. about all the manufacturing that's been done yeah. there over the last and the consultant is too. <laughs> I, I think yeah i yeah i was nervous about that too i did feel a lot better after speaking to the um the lsp for 84 more street um who was with gza um so we did have there's a <laughs> there's a lot of of materials that have been submitted to um mass dep for 84 more street that includes some some work awesome. that was done on our yeah. parcel well, i defer to your, your expertise <laughs> <laughs> and, um the lsp who's with horsley witten our design consultant was sort of looking through um those documents and had questions um because some of the labeling was ambiguous and it was like you know 20 years ago they found arsenic and then 10 years ago they didn't find arsenic um so he had questions to bring to mm -hmm. to the lsp um who had sort of most recently had their fingers in this um and after that conversation i think myself and and the Horsley Witten LSP and you know the other two consultants with Horsley Witten felt kind of like breathed a big sigh of relief because some of the things that we've been worried about they were able to, to clear up pretty effectively um but this still seems like sort of doing the right thing as far as our due diligence. Mm -hmm. Like some sense of <clears throat> this happening, maybe not at the right time in the whole process. Yes. Could you speak to that at all? The best possible time for us to have done this would have been before we bought the property. <laughs> right. Um, so when our consultants were asking me about it, I was trying to find out whether we had done that before we bought the property um and um you know couldn't couldn't turn up any evidence that it was something that we had looked into beyond sort of the sort of summary reports that um the commission and the planning board had gotten as part of the permitting process mm -hmm. for 84 morse mm -hmm. that's what happens when you don't take out a mortgage <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, so I I think that 
that was sort of some due diligence that was missed mm -hmm. on the part of the team. Um, and it's something a good learning that, opportunity, you know what I mean? Because we do, we buy it outright, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't deal with a, a bank who worries about the risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think yeah. it's a good, good thing to keep think in about mind for any sort of future yeah. acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, potentially dependent on the on the site history, right? This yeah. this site has, you know, a little bit of a higher risk of having mm. fill material and so on. Then it's just hard in our community. There's such a limited amount of space like this that's available right. for acquisition. Like yeah, and I, it's I, a risk I, assessment, anyway. right? Mm -hmm. So right. and this know, side of the, our side of the that's what I think is, for the water, right? So right. it like, right is it it, it is was not manufacturing per se whereas the other side clearly 84 who knows what happened on that side let's keep our fingers crossed right. <laughs> okay so obviously there's a lot we can take away from this but yeah. it sounds like um we can certainly be thankful to holly for working with cpc and to cpc for working to approve those additional funds because frankly, without those additional funds, I think this would have just wiped us out and then some or something, right? To try to cover the cost of this. There would have been some creative budgeting yeah, in anyways, there would have right? been creative budgeting. Mm -hmm. We could have just added it, like essentially the full cost of, of the project was allocated and we're getting money back from grants. So we could have maybe just spent more money and you know had the town get less money back from grants sure um but this is this seems like very a pretty... very preferable to be able to just sort of deal with it yeah. With, yeah with cash in hand rather than so it looks like we'd be looking maybe for a motion to approve the uh approximate difference right the approximate four thousand five hundred and sixty five dollars required to perform the soil characterization at bernie cooper park Maybe Olivia would like to do it in the last meeting. <gasps> right. Thank you. <laughs> Don't move. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Thank you for that. As we've done in the remote and hybrid environment, I'll go down the list of Conservation Commission members and just ask you to verbally state your position on this vote. Starting with myself, Stephen Washburn is in favor. Aye. Catherine Walsh. Aye. Carly Rockland. Aye. Peter Bamber. Aye. John Gear. Aye. Kelsey Quinlan. Aye. And Olivia Hagland. Aye. Thank you, Olivia. Um, okay. A lot to think about there. Uh, next up on the agenda, looks like we have Naponset Stormwater Partnership information. Some, yes. a lot of additional information that <laughs> yeah. I was compiled for us. So I didn't have this information when I first sent my notes to you all. Over You're the locked weekend, and loaded here. I, I can it. see. <laughs> I got it. Carrie sent it all over on yesterday. So. Um, <laughs> So what I learned about further about the swimming program that NEPRA runs is um, it seems like they're already doing water sampling at eight stations in Norwood. Um, and if we sort of opted into this portion of the um, stormwater partnership, um, it would help them cover their costs as a watershed of doing that testing. Um, and we would get some additional services from them, including following up on um, hotspots or um, discharges that seem like they could potentially be problems. Um, I do know that um, the town uses uh, CDM Smith to to do that as well. Um, so when I the Dennis see, Force stuff or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and they would prepare a specific water quality report to to Norwood that would be shared with us um, as well as a um, press release. Um, and it does go by fiscal year so um if we wanted to join we could join um starting in july essentially um which <laughs> relates to some of that budget discussion of we would have our 
our full budget back in, yeah. in hand. Um, but it would be July to, to June. Um, and she sent the full scope as well to, um, which is in black on, on the annotated agenda. And they would have a, we would be in the regional workshop as well. Yeah. yeah, I see layers of benefit to participating in things like that. I think that uh, the community that I work for participates at this level. I've seen the community specific reporting that's provided. I think maybe Kelsey can speak to this as well. It's pretty robust. It's pretty valuable for anyone that's interested in stormwater. Um, and certainly a major complement to any existing MS4, or in the case of Norwood, and the community I serve, a consent decree that's been uh, levied uh, by the EPA. Beyond that, I think that, yeah, it really just paints the picture across the entire watershed that we're contributing and participating at the highest level possible. There's press releases that say, say as much. There's regional water quality uh, workshops and collaborative efforts that occur. And I just think when you look at the big picture of like MS4 consent decree, stormwater, water quality, and everything that surrounds it and a lot of like the potential like footfalls that can <laughs> yeah. um, you can experience and the cost of those is so significant compared to like the pale cost of participating in this. I just think that to me, it feels like a no brainer, but I'm looking at this through like a very a jaded lens and that this is what I work with like constantly every day, all day. So experience counts. Maybe, yeah. but sometimes yeah, maybe it creates like yeah. some, you know, either like an inflated sense of importance because it's, you know, whatever, but yeah. So those are my three cents about it all. Do we have the funds available for this? In, Ju in July. In July we will. Yeah. yeah, so the other sort of budget um, update is that um, I will, I got a quote from Par, um, who, we use for our dam inspections. And so they have their quote for the every two year dam inspection, which is um, I think in the realm of $3,000. So then they repair, right. prepare that report for the Office of Dam Safety for us. Um, but they were also proposing to um, combine that with having a diver inspect the low level outlet this year. Um, which would be uh, additional. Um, so, and that was one of the recommendations uh, that they sort of have had in their last couple dam safety Can we just reports. put Steve in with a snorkel? I'll do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not last year. But they talked about it before. I don't know when they did it though. Um, I know that um, not the last time they did this in 2021, but 2019, they did operate the low level outlets right. to make sure that they worked. Um, That's the only thing I'm, I'm aware of. Yeah. I'm not remembering we used we went on the site tour. I thought they had done put a diver in there to do a low level inspection. So You're thinking of Willis. Yes, I am. So okay. Ellis is the one that we own. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I did the same thing in my yeah. head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just didn't even open my mouth. I knew it just feels there. like I yeah. must be wrong. I don't yeah. know why. Yeah. I just feel like, yeah. So yeah. there's been multiple recommendations to do it. I mean, we haven't. Um, it yeah. Well, <clears> right. So in 2019, oh, yeah. Um, and the DPW are the folks who who operate the gates and, mm -hmm. as well as the low level outlooks when needed. And they expressed that the next time that they operated the low level outlet, they would prefer to have a diver available because the concern is they open and they can't close it. Right. right. And but in the pond drain. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so having a diver means if something gets stuck. Then How much person. money is it to do that? So that is, I wish I had prepared the quote, but that was more. That was yeah, that was like six thousand. Okay. Um, so yeah. if we combine both of those, it'll be if it's like it'll wipe out the rest yeah. of our budget. That's still a reasonable price, though. It's six yeah. grand for both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So so that would sort of be 
done for the year. No more yeah. treats for the community garden or <laughs> yeah. Um, done for the fiscal year. For the fiscal year, yeah. Until until July. It's coming fast. It's yes, it, it will be here before we know oh, it. Yeah. And we do actually, if we, right, we also have a donation account that has $5,000 in it, and we have our Well and Protection Act for anything related to enforcement mm -hmm. Protection Act, and um, we do as well have the ability to use our, I don't think we should, but um, if the need arises, we have the option of using the land acquisition fund for conservation land right. management as well. Around this time last year, I think it was probably me griping about it, but I think that just a, maybe as a result of some of my uncertainty surrounding just the new format of budgeting and the multi-departmental shift and all of that happening, last year at this time, I felt very uncertain about like what was coming, where we were going, like how the funding was going to be allocated and what role the treasurer was going to be playing moving forward. I will yeah. confess, I still have no idea what role the treasurer plays like in this realm of like interface with the budget and expense and, and otherwise, but I do feel a lot more confident with just the general flow of things and the availability of funding. However, I guess what I'm getting at is that with the impending rollover of the fiscal year, should we be thinking about having um, an item on a future agenda sometime soon to review just accounts, existing monies that are still kind of sitting in a bucket somewhere or not, uh, get yeah. a sense of expenses over the last year. Yeah. We're coming kind of down a little close, right? I'm not saying we're running on fumes, but we're coming down yeah. here and spending pretty pretty tight. Uh, maybe I would just suggest and welcome like a, just a more formal conversation to review our expenses yeah, yeah. over the last year, the budget for the last fiscal year, the new budget's coming, and there may be some opportunity, if it's not already too late, to, um, you know, yeah, just affect yeah. that a little bit or otherwise. So maybe I could request that, Holly. Yeah. And sure. then we could look at funding. Things like swim and, right. and whatever. Which, which uh, the diver, diver. The yeah. diving. Well, I endorse both. So. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah, well, likewise. likewise. Yeah. It seems like the, that's the general <laughs> yeah. sentiment. But maybe we could have that conversation and then make some of those decisions about swimming, about the diver, you know, hybrid approach to that contract and otherwise. What comes out of what budget? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's just always good, I think, to understand, like, there's a few buckets, what's in them. Yeah, well, traditionally, I always had that dance where anything you could, you had to do before July 1 or encumber before then, and then what you had to encumber after. One so, other question, so though, we're talking about the dam bit. issues. Mm -hmm. Do we have actual drawings on the dam structure as far as these gates? The reason I ask is if you send in a diver in the water, let's say for the sake of argument, he gets down there and he looks at something and there's a bolt that's corroded. Yeah, you're just put that on a recorder. Can we say, guess what? We have these three or four bolts that are associated with that. Why you hit, so that we don't have to pay to come back. I see. Um, that's pretty nice. Yeah. I just use some back. details of the. Yeah. So and is the Mark inspection guy the guy who's going to do the repairs? Though that's the real question. Right. Yeah. Maybe he could be if we ask in advance. Yeah. Mark has plans of the dam. I don't know if it's granular enough to show the bolts um, or like what the bolt specs are. It might not even be anything there that re needs replacement, you know, or, or is meant to be replaced. Yeah. Has it been the same firm doing the inspections throughout time? Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so I don't well, know if it's, it's throughout time, but, but it's for the past few years, or? many, many years. Yeah, so they, you know, what you're right, it's probably worth asking. Um, you know, you sort of giving them allowance, right? So if they see something down there, you know, I can say, you'd like to bring a few spare pies. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Can you bring you know? a gate down there? Yeah, yeah. probably just need a crowbar. <laughs> well, who knows that you're right to say, yeah. John, there could yeah. be a detail available in the construction drawings. I've seen yeah. 100 year old plans that had. Lots of incredibly yeah. impressed engineering yes. present, yeah. right? So just because the engineering is old doesn't mean it's bad or incomplete or otherwise. So it's worth and it's not that old. We rebuilt that dam in the nineties. Early nineties. Oh gosh. Oh, wow. So I would expect a construction detail of yeah. that feature. Yeah. But um, very early nineties. <laughs> oh, never mind. Lost the thought. Sorry. 
<laughs> oh no, I, the thought was um, they did uh, camera um, the low level outlets last summer. Um, so from what the camera shows, it seems like things are in good shape. Well, good. Yeah. It was several years. Ago. I've been envisioning the worst, you know, yeah. this like corroded process. And now they took down the old dam. Well, you're yeah. you're still thinking of Willet Pond. Well, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. That one's yeah. 100 years old. This I think I have to get the rock yeah. yeah. There used to be two uh, outlets on Ellis Pond on either end of the dam. Oh. And they took out the one, uh, not the northern one right out. And they just left the other one in and redid it. But they used to be two that met and then went under. That makes sense because that's where the channel is. Right, exactly. That was that. In fact, that was probably the main spillway for a majority of the time. Oh, and now it's the emergency spillway. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. really like to have. I just used to put boards in. Yeah. And then slide the boards. So down. yeah, let's not have any unauthorized board sliding. <laughs> So then we'll have an agenda item to review the fiscal year, the annual budget, past expenses, future anticipated expenses, and where everything stands. And then we can make some informed decisions about swimming and our engagement and funding of that and the diving stuff and otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And okay. I will say um, this isn't quite the right agenda item um, for this, but. I would anticipate a long meeting next or next meeting. Um, we will have a controversial subdivision on our agenda. So when is the next meeting? It will be May 10th. May 10th. And I have booked the senior center for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll include the expenses and budget on that meeting, but it's possible that uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't even bother then. Just wait until the meeting yeah. thereafter. If you want We're still, we still plenty of time. You can always yeah. provide the information when you have it, and then we can do it. Meet uh, future. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, provide the info for review, and then we talk about it in six weeks or whatever. Planning board class. No, so their planning board uh, is discussing it again at their next meeting on Monday, and after that, they're going to wait for our comments. Um, so that the uh, developer or applicant can make any any changes related to our review before um, going back to, to them. Can we request their comments that may impact that potentially impact us? Sure. Yeah, so only, the planning... all, and only those comments, frankly. So. I think what would make sense maybe is to get the planning board has had um, a number of memos from department heads like Mark Bryan, mm -hmm. as well as um, a peer review for the uh, stormwater and the hydrogeology. Um, and so I'll make sure that we all have the chance to review those and I can maybe ask Sarah for a a memo of of any sort of like planner comments that um, might be pertinent. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. How about your agent update, Holly? Okay. So. Um, the agent update is sort of a good um, place also to to talk about this um, upcoming hearing. I did want to maybe find out even before our next meeting if anyone wants to visit this site. I could arrange a site visit um, prior to the hearing for any commissioners who are interested. Seeing that, yeah, I think it would help, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess it's. I feel like I've been issued this ominous warning, and now being asked, "Do you want to check it out?" I guess so. I guess I. I, know. I guess I better. <laughs> it's just so much easier to, you know, make decisions when you right. have a visual. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and it's easier to interpret the plan too when you can stand there and look at the land that the plan is talking about. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so 
I have a doodle, doodle. Okay. Um, for that. Uh, we'll, we'll try and schedule it before the hearing. Um, otherwise, for the agent update, um, everyone has already heard that it's Olivia's last meeting with us. Um, so um, I'm sure you there you a party, Olivia. Um, <laughs> but uh, instead, you'll have to give me your address so we can send you a thank you card, maybe. Um, I I personally would like to thank Olivia for her service, both as a commissioner and also as um, our department's intern last summer. Um, she has contributed a lot to the town that will have um, lasting benefit, um, particularly with the invasive species um, management guidelines that are now available to residents. Um, so. Good luck with what comes next, Olivia, and we'll miss you. Thanks, Olivia. Yeah, thank, thank you, Olivia. Olivia. Appreciate it. Holly, you saying what thank you Thank you all so much. Olivia, I want to share a funny story um, about you, if I can. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> well, well, I, it's, more me, it's more me being the, the clown, I promise. Um, <laughs> no worries. I, had, I love a good story. I had heard from so many different people in the community at varying places about Olivia before I met her. I had heard from people uh, like Holly, people like uh, former Commissioner Lee Leach, uh, from members of the Norwood Community Food Pantry. I had heard Olivia's name mentioned so many times, right? Oh, Olivia brought green beans and, you know, strap peas and string beans by from the community garden. And Holly told me, oh, Olivia's doing this, that, the other thing, whatever it was, digitizing this, whatever it might have been she was helping with. And then I recall, uh, talking to Holly about, you know, like months down the road, this new commissioner, right? Oh, there's a new commissioner coming. It kind of came out of nowhere. I was sort of like, oh, what's going on? Oh my God. And so it's, you'll, you'll meet her. It's fine. It's uh, this nice young lady, Olivia Hagwin, whatever. And somehow me being the buffoon I am, there were two separate people in my mind, right? There was Olivia, the super helpful, remarkable, like friend of friends and friend of the pantry and community and otherwise. And then there was this Olivia that was going to be joining the com, -com. And it wasn't until Olivia's first meeting that I realized, like, no, oh God, like two Olivia, we're actually one Olivia, and this <laughs> individual that seemed to be two was, in fact, uh, just one in you, Olivia. So I thought that was kind of a fun <laughs> tale or whatever, and a little embarrassing for me, but um, hopefully it speaks to how much I appreciate all that you've done and all that you've touched in our community. So thank you, Olivia. You have the thank impact. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess maybe that was like the point I was really stumbling <laughs> trying to make is that you had done so much. I thought it was two people in the community. There you know. things and it was, it was right. star Olivia Hagman. So thank you, Olivia. Yes. Thank you and all so much. If the Norwood motto has anything to say about it, we'll see you. You'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be back. Right. Right. Water, Olivia. Yeah. <laughs> Um, All right, Holly, what else do you have to say? Um, well, I am very excited to let you all know that uh, my colleague in the planning department, Sarah, um, has officially, formally, and finally been hired as the planning director, um, the position that Paul Helkio just left um, at the beginning of December. So I'm excited to have that position uh, filled and I'm excited that it's uh, Sarah who I'll be continuing to work with. And she's been um, doing that job as well as her job um, and making it look uh, possible. <laughs> because we have two Sarahs as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so um, I am excited for that and I know that she will be a good ally for conservation moving forward. Um, I also want to remind everyone that um, this coming weekend is Earth Day. Uh, there is a buffet of Earth Day activities. Um, if you want to Earth Day on Saturday, you can pick up trash and remediate invasive species at the Bernie Cooper Park starting at 9 a.m., I believe ending at noon. Uh, if you want to Earth Day on Sunday, you can sign up for any number of sites with Progress Norwood. And I think the 
only conservation property is ending um, if, if people want to do a conservation property. Um, and that starts at 10. And then there's an Earth Day Fair starting at noon, I think, 1130 yeah. on the common if the weather is nice or the high school gymnasium if the weather is less nice. Um, what day is that? That's on Sunday. Sunday. And you can find me representing us and Carly representing us and also um, the uh, native planting initiative that Carly has started um, in Norwood, as well as lots of other good things. Um, not as good as us, but still pretty good. <laughs> um, I also want to highlight that next week, our own Commissioner Rockland will be giving a talk at the Norwood Public Library about um, said native planting initiative. Do you want to yeah. say any more about that? Yes, sustainable gardening. <laughs> no, you just got to come. Native plants. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah she, awesome. uh, she got, it's, it's that forum that I started on Facebook, it's awesome. Gardening with the Environment. So it's 7 p.m. the library on Tuesday. Great. You have to register? Yes. Free, but it, you can it's on the library website but if you don't register and you come anyway then you won't catch it. <laughs> there's no bouncer spoiler there's no bouncer i'm going to crash the party and promote my planting in the median strip idea <laughs> right. you can just play me there to get some books and slide in yeah <laughs> slide in, it's easy i did it <laughs> um i would also like to take this time to highlight the work of Com uh, commissioner quinlan who has been uh, working um, to get Norwood designated as a tree city with the Arbor Day Foundation. Um, and I have been sort of doing the required staff portion of that, but Kelsey has been doing the bulk of the work for it. Um, so um, that is awesome. What is that about? So we get cool signs <laughs> we can put saying Norwood is a tree city, but it also um, is sort of a formal commitment to, to tree planting and caring for trees. Um, it includes issuing a proclamation about Arbor Day. Um, and I was mentioning to Kelsey, it also seems like the tree city designation might end up being part of um, sort of uh, the scoring system for some upcoming grants mm. that like the state is changing the green communities grant and the that's one of the criteria that they're considering including for for sort of the green communities 2.0 yeah. so right. it'll it'll sort of position us well strategically to um get some state money as well as being the right thing to do <laughs> yeah. yeah i love that um something that i have a lot of interest in is heritage tree programs mm -hmm. in communities is that something that norwood like has or has interest in or has what is that i that's, so, that's like when trees, trees are specific trees? well specific trees actually individual trees are like tagged as a heritage tree for different reasons maybe it's a rare or endangered really species big. it's really old it's really big maybe it grew in a particular way maybe there's a number of different things that could help like, qualify you know, such as the elm trees that used to exist and they now have a version of life that is die off and then yeah. there's, there's a number of trees like that uh, yeah heritage trees so maybe that um, used to be here but they're no longer here maybe like one of the town founders planted it so you yeah. know young edwin dean or something planted this thing as oh, a child yes, oh, so, yeah so then it would be identifying them preserving them although right. you identify them and quietly preserve them right well it, and i think some communities start to adopt like regulations or bylaws that then protect those right. heritage trees once an inventory has been established and criteria to so, populate that inventory has been yeah what do you i'm got? not sure if this is the same thing but there is a statewide legacy tree program that is run by dcr that formally recognizes the largest and most interesting 
known trees of each species, trees of historical origins. Yeah, here we go. And other trees of yeah, same, significant yeah. importance within Massachusetts. Yep, sounds like a synonym. Yep, sounds so like the same idea. That's a state program. I don't think Norwood has anything. I've seen like communities, cities, municipalities individually develop their own. And I've heard it co coined that heritage tree program. Mm -hmm. um, Seattle has a really rad one that I reviewed recently, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be modeling maybe some work I do professionally after the approach they took in Seattle. Oh. Um, but it's definitely leagues above what I've seen most cities or towns do in that realm. Um, their, yeah, their forestry program is remarkable. And one of the things they did was this heritage tree program mm -hmm. that tied to local bylaws and regulations to afford further protections uh, for special trees. I, I think cool. the great thing about this application is it's, it, it has highlighted a lot of the work that's already being undertaken by the town. But in addition, mm -hmm. it provides a lot of information and samples and guides to beef up <laughs> anything that it so desires in the future. Yep. You know. One of those being a tree ordinance in the town. Um, we don't have one, but um, through Chapter 87, we, we feel that that would 87 correct. Um, that would suffice for this application. But it, it gives you a lot of resources where if you want to take the next steps, and if that's the desire and will of the community, there, there's a lot more that can be done too. Yep, yeah, sweet. So Holly mentioned that uh, it might open up some grant money down the road. But in addition to that, is there any offerings for Trees? I don't think so. No? There's like a greening the, I forget the name of the program, greening the gateway city, something foolish okay. like that. Where there is a, nor, so the gateway cities are like a specific group of cities is it? in Massachusetts. It's like Worcester, Springfield, Brockton. Economically depressed. Yeah, so that's, we're not a gateway city. So we don't that qualify for program. that planting. Yep. Yeah, I, I saw some pretty, Pretty good action coming out of that. Yeah, a lot of plantings. So. Doesn't mean we, yeah. don't we can't put something together and do it ourselves. So. Sure. Yeah. Right. Well, and so part of this application, we highlight how many trees are planted annually, and you know, can always add future commitments to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I always think back to what got me involved in this. Dare I say nonsense endearingly? Mm -hmm. In the first place, was that green space analysis I did as part of the Forbes subcommittee that was deciding the future and fate of that property and it was really i still think about the statistics that came out of that norwood compared to every adjacent community has less green space less open space mm -hmm. uh more protected wetlands than the average and it's yeah it's just really tough to do accessible mm -hmm. usable things with open space and green well, space that's why norwood maybe our own effective small targeted program might be something. Yeah, it'd be wonderful. Yeah, I love to hear that we're doing this with the, um, what's the exact name, the uh, city, tree city designation? Yeah, it just feels like another step in that, that right direction of trying to either correct some of the deficit or at least like draw a, a heavier line, you know. And um, so the recommendation from the sustainability committee to, you know, pursue this application, um, it aligns with some of the other you know, goals that the town's already set forth in certain action plans where, you know, to address future climate change and all this, mm -hmm. you know, to plant more trees alongside roads. So kind of hopefully bringing all those things together in the future, there'll be more action on planting. I love that. Great. Well, thank you, Kelsey and Holly. That's great. What else, Holly? I think that's it. No minutes today. Okay, maybe next, next time. Suppose we just have a motion to adjourn remaining. Olivia, would you do us the honor? Well, actually, does she have any closing remarks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. I um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. When we were talking about the orchard and the irrigation, I was thinking back to what got me started in the conservation commission was actually doing the watering myself. So I'm really, really excited that that project is culminating at the very end of my tenure and I'm not moving too far just West Roxbury and my parents still live in Norwood so I'm sure I'll see everybody around at some point but I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Holly um, specifically for all of her support from the summer to now and then for everybody else for being so kind and welcoming on the commission it's been truly a pleasure and I'm excited to potentially continue 
um, being civically engaged in my new town and Norwood. So thank you very much. And thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Olivia. You can join the Boston Congress. Yeah, I know that. that we'll see. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm sure I'm sure I'll be around and see you guys. If not in the, the town hall, then in the town in general. So thank you very much. We'll see we'll see you at the Lewis's. orchard. Yeah, right, exactly. Fine. Fine. The orchard, then Lewis. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure you could avoid civic yeah. engagement wherever you land, Olivia. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. So how about that motion, Olivia? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. As we've done in the remote and hybrid environment, I'll go down the list of Conservation Commission members. Just ask you to verbally state your position on this vote, starting with myself. Stephen Washburn is in favor. Mm -hmm. Aye. Catherine Walsh. Aye. Carly Rockland. Aye. Peter yes. Bamber. Aye. John Gear. Aye. Kelsey Quinlan. Aye. Last but certainly not least, Olivia Haglin. Aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Scott.